Good evening. We're going to get started. Glad to see you in the Lord's house tonight. I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad you're saved. Amen? Jesus is coming soon, ready or not. I want to just read three verses, if I can, before we get started in prayer. Hebrews chapter five, uh, 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, and by the way, that's the only place in your Bible you'll find that phrase, because he's talking about Jesus. Amen. Seeing then we have a, a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we, re for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. That's assurance tonight for me. Amen. What's assurance for me is that God's in charge. This world's got lost its mind. It's gone off on the deep end, but God's on the throne and he's in control. And he's just like a chess match. He's moving the, the pieces in place. Amen. And I just want to say publicly, give God the glory that one of our grand, grandkids got saved Sunday. Amen. You say, well, that's already happened. We've heard all about that. Let's move on. No, I'm going to sit down and rest right there for a little bit. That's number five. We got four more to go. Amen. You say, you really believe God's going to do it? I believe he's going to do the first five. I know he's going to do the last four. Amen. I, I know he's in charge and I trust him. Father God, in Jesus' name tonight, we thank you for saving Preston on Sunday and Bubba and the other children and the other adults and all that you've done. God, we give you thanks and praise and glory and honor because, God, you did that. We're just tools. We're just instruments that you can use. I planted a polished water, but God gave the increase. And, Father, we give you thanks and praise tonight. Lord, we love you that you're the great high priest. We love you that you're touched with the feeling of our infirmity. We love you that, God, you have ordained this time for such a time as this, God, you have ordained this segment of time and eternity is on its way. And God, we look forward to all that you're going to do. God bless tonight. Bless all that is said and done. Touch your men. Touch the singing. Bless everything that takes place in this service. God, may you be exalted and magnified and lifted up. Oh, oh magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together in Jesus' name. Y'all stand with us and sing the old rugged cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. The Where the deer is standing To my home far away 
because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know Thank you so much for those songs, and we're reminded that there's an empty grave. And as we will celebrate Easter in just a few days, I'm so thankful for that empty grave. Amen? Amen? Amen. Because he lives, I'm going to live again. This is nothing here in what he's got in store for us. And uh, that empty grave, I've been to Israel a couple of times, and I know you have. And when you go down there, there's no one there at that grave. Amen? One day, we're going to be out of here. Amen? It's good to see you on this Wednesday afternoon. A lot of things been happening on the property today. Uh, the kids are next door. 
the teens and the children are getting ready for a wild activity tonight. So uh, we are so glad. We're glad for them. And we're glad that, as Brother Doug already mentioned about his grandson being saved on Sunday, and we praise the Lord for that. And then there was six here in the sanctuary, and then three total over there, nine people. Amen. That won't get to go to hell, but they'll go to heaven. Amen? Amen. Amen. What, a, what a day on Sunday as we had those salvations, and then we were here with Danny and his family with the home going of your dad. It's been here for almost 60 years, and we celebrated his life, and now he's in heaven waiting on us, and uh, boy, it's real. It's real, and I can't wait. I can't wait. We could pull out of here tonight. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Well, let's go and pray, too. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love for us, and thank you for what's going on in this property this evening. We thank you that you are alive, and because you live, amen, I'm going to live too. And Father, we're so thankful for that empty grave as we will celebrate on Sunday that resurrection. Father, one day we'll see the Leroy Hip. We'll see all the others. We'll see Robert Thomas and all those that's gone this past week. And Lord, we've got loved ones there that we will see. And we're so thankful for that empty grave. We've all here tonight, if we think about it, we've got so many so many that's there and one day this is going to be reality and our faith is going to become sight and father we're so thankful we thank you for this offering we thank you for all the ministries even that's happening here tonight we pray that you would pour out this offering in order that we can see more people come to know you pray for the missionaries that we'll hear from in just a few minutes. We're so thankful for them this morning to know that there's others being born into the family of God. And Father, we love you. Help us to serve you. In Christ's name we ask. Amen and amen. You do your very best as unto the Lord and couple of announcements for this evening for next week uh, there will be no meals the kitchen crew is going to take uh, Wednesday off so you uh, re be reminded of that also uh, no meals in the a.m. or the p.m. so uh, let's be mindful of that and make plans for that also new members class Pastor Winston has been talking about that for the last couple weeks we begin that next or in next month in April, April 14th and April 21st. If you want to know more about Trinity, if you have been here for a long time, we find out that people's been here for years but just never made the step to join. If you want to find out more and go to that step, that next level, uh, meet us or actually call the church office first and let us get you signed up. Uh, Sister Sandy, uh, stand up, Sister Pam. Either one, you uh, call and let them know that you're interested in new members and we'll get you signed up for those classes in April. And uh, we look forward to meeting new people and uh, we look forward to this church. Uh, I, or people ask all the time, what's going on over there? And I said, you just need to come and find out. And uh, amen. It's... It's good to be here. It's good to be here. And the last thing, if this is your first time here, 
we want to get acquainted with you. In the seat back in front of you, there's a family care card. Fill that out, and there'll be a couple ladies there in the vestibule. If you'll turn that in, we want to get a record of your visit, and we've got a gift for you. So if this is your first time here at Trinity, we want to say welcome, and we want to say thank you for coming and being a part of this service. Brother Ben, it has been so good. I just love walking in that door on Wednesdays and you all are practicing and playing and I mean it's just lifting. When you hear those hymns, Brother Larry, it's just, I don't know, it's just good. And uh, you sing for us this evening at this time, okay?
I don't know about y'all, but I love these boring Wednesday night Bible studies. I, d- I tell you, God's presence is here. He's been hanging around all day. I can't really talk about it. My cup's running over because he's real, because he's been saving people in our little church. He's been moving. He's got our little pastor broken down like a shotgun, cleaning out both barrels and emptying it on us. And it hurts sometimes, I'll be honest with you. But boy, I love it. It feeds my soul when he delivers what God's got in his heart and put on his mind from the Word of God. Listen, I'm excited to be here tonight. I love Wednesday night church. You can let your hair down. You can take your ties off. Yes, sir. There you go. And you can worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Make yourself at home. We're home folks. We love each other. If you're new to Trinity Baptist Church, this is family. You take your shoes off, set a spell, and take it out your notebook, take good notes, love one another, hug on each other's neck, eat a good supper together. I mean, what in the world else is there? We got God and we got each other, and there's a lot to be happy about. Just in that, in the Lord. Bridges are collapsing, literally. The world's collapsing. The economy's collapsing. Our government is crumbling right in front of us. But I have peace. Why is that? Because he's in charge and he's coming back. That should excite us as Christians. Because he tells us in 2 Timothy, perilous times, they're here. Those are the signs. We're in the middle of it. He's coming back to get us. He's not coming back to get the world. As John 17 says, he's coming back to get us. Those that he's given to the Father and they're in his hands. Bro, I'm excited to be. Thank you. Amen, sister. The Lord's coming back to get us. And what do we do? We are to be busy while we're waiting. We don't sit and wait. We work and wait. Amen? And that's why we have missionaries to come by here and tell us what God's given them. It's not their burden. It's not their job to give you and me their burden. God's given that to them. It's their job to convince me they've got a burden. And you can tell when a young man gets up here or a seasoned man gets up here and he's got a passion for what God's called him to do. And he delivers that to us. I want to get behind a man like that. I want to support him with my money. I want to support him with my prayer. And our church family get behind him and and see God do great things in the place where God's planted him. Turn real quick before Brother Taru comes. I want to share this one thought with you and then we're going to move right on. In 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy, let me get my notebook turned over here. 2 Timothy chapter 4. You know what chapter 3 is. I just alluded to it just briefly. Verse uh, 3, 1 says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Not maybe, Not if, this, that, or that. What Perilous times shall come. They're coming. Well, it's like we've said for about a year now. We're not seeing the end times coming. We're in, I-N, the end, E-N-D, times. We're in them. This know also, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. And go through that passage. Go through those, all of those of verses there, down to verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Are we not in the middle of that right now? People just getting worse, deceiving. Your eyes see something and the pundits will tell you 180 degrees the other way of what you're seeing that's not the truth. Your eyes say one thing and they're telling you in your ears something else. Worse and worse. Things are going to get worse. But content, now I love this. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. And we're going somewhere. Knowing of whom thou hast learned them. 
and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus. Now, 16 and 17 are in there because of the other verses. Perilous times, seducers, worse and worse. All of this is coming. It's on us. But all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man and woman of God may be perfect, that's mature, thoroughly furnished, that means completely furnished, unto all good works. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be dumb. We don't have to be part of the chaos. We don't have to be ignorant. Why? Because we have the tangible, we have it. We can touch it. We can feel it. We can smell it. We can see it. We can read it. Tangible word of God. It's given to us. He left it for us because all of these perilous times are coming. And he knew we would need something tangible to hold on to. So write these three things down. Guard the truth. Guard it. Guard the truth. Don't let some liar tell you something that isn't the truth. If it goes against the word of God, it's a lie. Period. No gray area. It's black and white. Don't guard, so guard the truth. That means guard this. Put it in your heart. A Proverbs tells us to hide it in our heart. Okay? Then number two, continue in the truth. That's where the war that Pastor Winston has been talking so much about lately, that's where we've got to continue. That grinding, that fighting, that toiling, that persecution, the suffering, all that goes a part of our life, of what we're living in now, of what these missionaries and pastors in other countries are experiencing that's for all of us, all, God's, all those that are saved, all those that are at the part of the bride. We are to continue to guard the truth. We're to continue in the truth. And this is the truth. And then lastly, we preach and we live the truth. So guard the truth, continue in the truth, live and preach the truth. Let's stick to what got us here. James Alexander Stewart and Ralph Sexton Sr., began to follow God's word. They began to follow, follow the calling that God had put in their heart for this area. They, they didn't talk about their wisdom. They didn't talk about the books they had written. Oh, this is the way. No, sir. This right here, God's word, has been the guidepost. It has been the roadmap, if you will. It's been everything for Trinity Baptist Church. And with God's help... And you praying and a pastor who's burdened, we will continue. We will guard the truth. We will continue in the truth. We will preach and live the truth. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. And that's why it's so exciting to have missionaries come through. Ones that, we want to, that, that I want to introduce to you. Men of God that are faithful already in the calling God's given them. They're faithful to guard the truth. They preach the truth. They don't preach some false doctrine. And they tell others, areas that I can't go to, I can't go to Myanmar. I can't go to where my brother is. Americans aren't allowed in there. He can go and preach. He doesn't preach a different gospel. He preaches this right here. Thus saith the Lord. The death, the burial, the resurrection. Oh, here we are Wednesday, crucifixion day. Just what's coming, resurrection, victory, power. That's what these men are preaching. And then our brother in Panama, preaching the gospel. So, Brother Taru, brother, I, I had to get that off my chest, brother. The Lord had given it to me this afternoon, just reading this and understanding. Go ahead, guys, and read 2 Timothy chapter 4 as, as well tonight. Uh, uh, looking out, it's, just, read this, just read this passage. It'll encourage your heart to guard the truth, continue in the truth, preach and live the truth. But Teru Marshall is no stranger to Trinity. He's been here many times. He and I have been friends for 50 years. We go way back from Chattanooga days, Murfreesboro days, and I've seen God use this man. His family, he was raised, his dad was a great evangelist, and 
uh, love the Lord, his brother. We know Brother uh, Tad and just God's blessed this family. And he's continued in the straight and narrow. He's not gone to the left or the right. He's not followed every wind of doctrine. He stayed in the book. And I love Brother Teru and the ministry that God has given him. I want him to introduce the two men that he's brought with him. I want you to pray two things. To pray that God would use these men where they are. And then number two, let's pray that God would move in our hearts to support them. They're national pastors. We don't have to send them to language school. We don't have to set up their homes. They're in their country now. All they have to do is be supported and go plant churches. And both of them have already done that and they continue to do that. Brother True, Amen. God bless you, brother. Let's give him a Trinity welcome. Brother Thank you, Dwight. I, I do appreciate that. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. I mean, it is a great great privilege to be here tonight and just love being in this place. Uh, as he said, my name is Taru Marshall. I know that's an unusual name. You see me later, I'll tell you where I got it and why. But uh, I'm the only one in the United States, by the way, maybe the world. So if you ever see that name in the paper and he's in trouble, it's me. I'm sorry. Uh, I've been an evangelist for 42 years, but in 1997, went into Cuba and began to work with pastors there, realized the need they had, began taking in support, helping them that ministry has now grown into a worldwide ministry. Uh, Nationals Outreach Worldwide is where we get the now ministries from. It is a ministry that is uh, accomplishing the Great Commission by training, equipping, and then financially supporting national pastors in their countries so they can reach their people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many times in places where Americans or foreign missionaries cannot go or where American missionaries will not go. So we've got two men with us tonight and we're going to let you... Uh, see their ministries, what they're doing, hear from them. One from a very restricted uh, nation, uh, Myanmar, uh, where the military coup has occurred and Christians are being killed, churches are being bombed. Uh, he's even under threat as he's here. And so when he gives his testimony, we'll black out his face on the television, on the feed, but you'll still get to hear his voice. But I want you to see what they're doing. And then we also have a man from Panama. We're going to show each of them a short video of their ministry and then they'll come give you a short testimony about what they're doing. First of all, we'll introduce Brother Rodrigo Contreras. He is from Panama. He's doing a wonderful work there in that country and uh, been pastoring there now for 18 years. Uh, and uh, I was there with him just a year ago and helped him get a new church started. Went up in the mountains and preached. They'll have a little crusade there. 87 people saved in one afternoon. And after that, he, I said, Brother, you've got to start a church. He said, I know, we'll do it. And no other churches in that area. And now there's one there, but it's planted. People are hearing the gospel. So you watch his video, and then as soon as that video's over, then he'll come and give a testimony for you. family, your missionaries to the city of Panama. My wife, Danira, my daughter, Abigail, my son, Bilan, and I, Rodrigo Contreras, are sent by Bible Baptist Church of Long Beach, Pastor Luis Parada. The Iglesia Bautista Las Americas was established by winning souls to Christ, baptizing them and discipling them as our Lord has shown us in His Word. The Lord has blessed our work all these years, but there is still much to be done. The need is great, but we continue to take on the challenge of serving God in this country. We thank you for your prayers and support, which is fruit that abounds to your account. We extend our most heartfelt greetings and pray God continues to bless you and your family. God is sitting on his throne, anticipating another sinner will soon become his own. Years of wasted living and years of toil and strife are just about to be over. 
as he receives the gift of life. Go sound the horn, strike up the choir. A sinner is saved, saved from the fire. No more in darkness, he's received my son. That's the value of war. The Holy Spirit has been working to soften up their hearts. All he needs is a willing servant who will simply do his part. Can you imagine up in heaven the joy that will be that day? As a sinner bows his head to pray, and you hear the Father say, Go sound the horn, strike up the choir. A sinner is saved, saved from the fire. No more in darkness, he's received my soul. the value of one. Start construction on his mansion, there on Hallelujah Street. He doesn't know yet that it's waiting as the Savior he will be. say you that, some another. Who, what do you say about yourself? I'm a voice. Paul said, I can but speak the things I've seen and heard. What is Paul saying? I'm a voice. And I want to take those truths that, that my Sunday school teachers have given me through the years, and my mama gave me, and that my, those who've influenced my life have given me, and I want those truths to get out. And tonight, I'm a voice. in this world. We don't need talent. We need voices. We don't need dynamic. We need voices. We don't need pretty voices. We need voices. Voices to take the truth of our fathers, the faith of our fathers, and say to our generation, this is what they said. I'm saying, look, what the world needs to know is how to pray, how to read your Bible, how to get saved, how to read your kids, how to behave yourself, how to walk with God. That's what the world needs to know voices to go around this country taking the truths that we've learned and letting others know the truths that we've learned. Who are you, Brother Hiles? Dr. Jack Hiles, pastor of the largest Sunday school in the world. Oh, I'm just a voice. I'm just a voice. Who are you? The founder? I'm in Chancellor of Hiles Anderson College? No, no, I'm just a voice. What more?
are what a person want to be, just a voice. And sister, I try again <laughs> speaking um, uh, my testimony. Um, as I mentioned it in this morning, our desire is to return to Panama and continue with the plan to start the new church. Those people in that place need a church and pastor. Pray for us that the Lord will provide for, for us and help us full, fulfill the great commission of reaching, reach them, baptize them, and training them to life and serve the Lord. Understand, right? <laughs> Thank you, you, for, for, the, uh, for the opportunity, Pastor. It is a privilege to be with you in this day. Uh, we are grateful that you, Brother Toru, brought to us um, a, a tremendous um, a blessing for my ministry in Panama. Now ministry too. Um, at the age of 12, I was reached for Christ on a Wednesday night in March in 1986 by missionary James Childress who has served in the country for over 14 years. I was baptized a few years later, the Lord called me to serve him full time. Uh, my wife and I devote 18 years of our li life to sharing the gospel with the people of Panama. Will the Lord as our way us to see the result, type, result of our labors, prior and investment? There is still much land to conquer, many souls to win, and many families to assist. We train it and baptize one uh, of the first family we brought to Christ and they founded a church two hours away from our church, where the Lord is grateful using the Ballester family too. We want to bring to the Christ the vast majority of people, including young people and children, and we need transport help, uh, help, help us with the need and prayer. Um, we're grateful for the chance to come to your church and share our need for pray. Thank you uh, very much for the willingness and generosity to help Adran during this day. A great uh, thank you for the food, for everything. God bless you, brother. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rodrigo. Okay. Work there in Panama, and uh, we're looking forward to being with him again. Now we have another gentleman with us tonight. This is Issachar Mang, and he is from the country of Myanmar, formerly the country of Burma. Now the one thing about Burma we know is that Adonair Judson, the first American missionary, was a missionary to Burma. 135 different ethnic groups in that country, and out of the 60 years that Adonair Judson spent in that country, he reached three of those ethnic groups. So there's quite a task left, but through the work that Brother Mang is doing and what his car is doing there through the Bible College and the uh, uh, different works that he has, many of those unreached areas are being reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Watch his video. It's about three minutes long, and then he'll come, and he'll tell you more about his work. Myanmar, previously known as Burma, is home to more than 54 million people 
and has 135 different ethnic groups. Despite Adoniram Judson's efforts to spread the gospel across this country, his ministry only reached three of those groups. Myanmar has faced numerous challenges over the years, including war, foreign occupation, and totalitarian regimes. It has remained inaccessible to a sustainable Western missionary presence. The only way to see the gospel spread in this country is through the dedicated work of Myanmar nationals. Issachar Mang has worked tirelessly for many years alongside his father, Timothy Mang, and three uncles to spread the gospel to the people of Myanmar. He was saved at the age of 10 thanks to his mother's faithful witness, and he shares his father's evangelistic spirit. Issachar's primary concern is the number of lost souls in Myanmar and he is committed to winning them for Christ. He says, We know the Lord is coming soon, and we will continue to share the gospel until the end. In 2016, Issachar and his wife founded the Biblical Missionary Baptist Church, and he has served as pastor there for the last seven years. God has also used him to lead a ministry called Soldiers for Christ which has led to the salvation of hundreds and the establishment of seven churches. In 2022, God opened the door for them to plant a church that caters to the needs of the blind. Issachar, his family, and his team are reaching into areas no Westerner has gone before and are leading souls to Christ. Despite their daily challenges, they remain faithful in their service to the Lord. Will you join in making a difference in Myanmar? Will you support Issachar and his family as they lead the charge to spread the gospel to the unreached people of this needy country? Will you prayerfully consider supporting the Soldiers for Christ ministry as they preach the gospel and establish churches? Will you help financially support the Myanmar Bible College's efforts to train young men and women for the ministry? Please don't kill my daughter and my husband, please. That is the cry in Myanmar right now. Two years ago, the military has taken the power. The civilian, they fight back the military. Right now, the military and the, the civilians are fighting. The military right now are taking advantage with the monk and they are fighting and persecuting Christian. Hundreds of churches are burned and many children Christian children, uh, 16 years old, 15 years old, are raped and being killed. And not only that, last month, they have announced conscripted law between age 17 and 35. And they are uh, right now going house to house and arresting uh, these young people. How can we fight? How can we kill our own people by joining military? But they don't want. They force us. In fact, my name is already actually recorded and taken by the military right now. When I go back on this April 30, I don't know what awaits for me. So this is the situation of Myanmar, and I want really from my heart to all Trinity Baptist Church to pray for Myanmar right now. Thousands of young people are fleeing. We are in danger. But in the midst of all these things, by the grace of God, the soldiers of Jesus Christ ministry continue on. This ministry is evangelization and church planting ministry. We risk our life. Before I came here, I was in jail, in prison, because we went to mission field. We want to preach the gospel to these Buddhist people. We went there, and the military, they came, and then they arrested us and put into prison. Before that, they brought us to the forest. Every time the military bring people to the forest, there is no return. But by the grace of God, God miraculously uh, delivered us, and today I am here and continue on uh, by God's grace. My friend, in his place, the soldiers surrounded the village and kill the villagers. This is a Christian village. So the father, the, the family, they ran to the forest, 
but the mother was killed already. The military continued to pursue them. The baby was about eight years old, no food in the uh, forest, and the baby was sick for a, a week, and he was so weak, and eventually the military were chasing, and the father, instead of being killed by the military, he killed his very own daughter with tears. And my soldiers of Christ, missionary, are right now reaching these kind of people in those refugee places. They have to risk their life. And even if I go back today, if I die, if I leave, I will continue to preach the gospel. But if I die, someone for the soldiers of Christ will continue on because the gospel cannot be stopped by the devil and the world. Thank you very much, Pastor, for allowing me to stand here. And I want to say thank you very much, Uncle Teru and Now Ministry for taking the national and continued support entering us. God bless you all through the Baptist Church. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. I'll tell you what. We don't realize how well we have it in America, do we? And we don't realize sometimes what uh, these, some of these men have to go through and what they have to uh, accomplish in their life, what they have to deal with on a daily basis just to serve the Lord. And you really need to pray for Issachar. Seriously, he does not know what he's facing when he goes back. And so we need to really hold him up in prayer and his soldiers for Christ. Uh, when I first learned of the soldiers for Christ, I was there and Issachar told me, about the group, and he told me, he said, uh, together these, pe these young people have banded together, and among themselves, they've taken a vow. We'll give our life for Christ. Literally, we'll die for the cause of Christ. And they're facing that now in me and me. Take your Bibles, if you would, please. We'll take the few minutes we have left. Go to John chapter 9 and verse 4. John chapter 9. And we'll read just one verse there. And I want to encourage you this, this evening how we can finish the unfinished task. We've heard tonight uh, of some places where the gospel is, where it's never gone before. And now the gospel's going in there and people are being saved and churches are being started. People are being reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But there's so much more that needs to be done. All over the world tonight, there are nations who restrict Christianity. They uh, try to kill the Christians. They try to do everything they can to stop the church uh, from growing and to stop the church from progressing. But through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and because we love him and because we have people like Issachar, because we have people like Rodrigo, you cannot stop the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want us to look tonight as how we can finish this task that God has given us to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. Now when he said to go into all the world... He didn't mean just a few countries that we can get into. He meant every nation, every ethnic group, every tribe, every country is to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 9 and verse 4, Jesus said this to his disciples, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Jesus said to his disciples, while I'm here on this earth, I must do the job that my Father has given me to do. I must finish that job. And every one of us as Christians tonight have a responsibility and we have a job that God has called us to do. And we're to give our best and give our all to finish that work that God has set before us. But as the church, we have a job tonight and that is to reach this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. How are we going to finish that task? When I first started working in Cuba, I uh, uh, brought one of the gentlemen, the pastors from Cuba here. I don't know if you knew him, uh, Dwight. His name was Miguel and Hill. He was, uh, uh, at this time, was getting a little older. He had gone through the revolution. He'd actually been put in the work camps and been forced uh, to uh, go into the work camps because he was a Christian, because he was wanting to be a pastor. And he came here to America and I brought him in to tell him about Cuba and what was going on and what we planned to do there to help the people in Cuba, the churches there. And he would stand up and he would quote this scripture, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. And he would talk about the things that happened in Cuba and how that the churches were uh, uh, shut down and pastors were in prison. Some pastors were killed. 
uh, Christian families were uh, put under great stress and great strain. Even today, even though they're not put in prison as such, there's still great pressure on the Christians and the churches in Cuba. And uh, they're constantly harassed by the officials, harassed by immigration, harassed by the military. They're constantly put down by their government and they're denied certain things and they cannot have certain things, cannot go certain places, do certain things. And he talked about that, about going into the concentration camp, about being forced to work for the government because he wanted to be a Christian, because he wanted to be a pastor. And he said this, he made this statement. He said, our night came in Cuba. And for a while, the work was stopped. And for a while, the work was hampered. And then he asked this question. He said, when will your night come in America? My dear friend, it's coming quickly. We're seeing the forces of hell. We're seeing the forces of Satan prevail against the church. And they're do- this government and others in this country are doing everything they can to stop the, the, the progression of the gospel, to stop us from spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to finish this work while we have an opportunity. You say, well, Brother Marshall, how in the world are we going to finish this work? What is it going to take? What can we do? I'm just one person. I I can't go to Myanmar. I can't go to other nations. I can't travel around the world as some can do. What can I do so that we can help finish the work that God has given us to do? Well, I think it's very simple. And I'm going to give you three simple things tonight that every Christian can do. I'm talking every Christian. I'm talking young boys and girls. I'm talking teenagers. I'm talking young people. I'm talking newly married couples. I'm talking those who've been married for 30, 40, 50 years. I'm talking about people who are even approaching the fact that your life is about to end. There are three things that every Christian can do to help complete this work and get the gospel to the rest of the world. Are you ready? They're very simple, and I hope you understand them. And if we'll do these three things... I'll guarantee you we can finish the work that God has given us to do. Number one, the first thing that every Christian must and can do is simply this. Pray. Pray. Prayer is powerful. And God answers prayer. God wants to hear your prayer. In Matthew 9, 38, Jesus said, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. How often do we pray that prayer? How often do we take time and really pray honestly and seriously for the missionary? How often do we pray that God would send forth laborers to reach those who've never been reached before? Have you ever prayed for the unreached areas of Myanmar or Laos or Vietnam or other communist countries around the world uh, for someone to go and give the gospel where the gospel has never gone before. Every Christian can pray. We need to pray for the missionary. We need to pray for the lost. We need to pray that God would would touch their heart, that they would hear a clear presentation of the gospel, and when they hear it, that they would receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every Christian can pray. The Bible tells us time and time again that we should pray. I remember many years, several years ago it was, I was in Myanmar, and I was speaking to the missionaries. I, I love Issachar's father, Timothy. He and I are just like brothers. He, he's an evangelist, I'm an evangelist. And we get along so well. We think alike. We, we, uh, our actions are alike. And we preach alike. And I, I just, I love Brother Timothy. The only thing was, he thought I could speak longer than I could. We were there for a missions conference. Had brought all the missionaries together from all over the country. Some had walked for several days to get there. As Issachar mentioned, uh, one of the missionaries who came actually had just gotten out of prison for preaching the gospel. And he came to that conference and he said, when I get back, he said, I'll probably go back to prison because he said, I'm not going to stop preaching. He said, Brother Marshall, you have three hours in the morning and three hours in the afternoon. Uh, don't, ble- don't be afraid tonight. I will not preach that long tonight, all right? But that's what he wanted me to do. I said, Brother Mang, I said, I can't preach for three hours. He said, well, fill all of it you can. I said, here's what I'll do. I'll speak for some time, maybe an hour or so. I said, then I'm going to turn it over to you. I want to hear the testimonies of the missionaries. He said, all right, we'll do that. And so after uh, I was done, I think it was the first or second day, Brother Timothy had missionaries to come, gave their testimonies, talked about their works and 
things they were doing and miraculous things that God was doing through their ministries. But one lady in particular came. And I'll make the story as short as I can, but basically her story was this, that her and her husband were trained at the Bible college, went to the mission field, but after some time, because of the oppression of the Buddhists and because of uh, different things that happened, they had to come off the mission field, came back to the Bible college, and began to pray about where God wanted them to go. While they were at the Bible college praying about where God wanted them to go next, her husband became very sick, and soon he died. And now she's left all alone. Brother Timothy came to her and said, now we're going to do everything we can to help you, but the monies that we've given to you, that we've subscribed to you to go as a missionary, said, that needs to go to another missionary couple now who's ready to go. She said, I understand. She said, but would you do this one thing for me, Brother Mang? She said, would you pay me like a secretary? A secretary at the Bible college there gets $10 a month. She said, if you'll pay me like a secretary, I'll spend all my time praying for the missionaries. He thought about it. He said, all right, let's try it. She lives at the children's home, the orphanage. She gets them every morning. She helps fix the breakfast for the orphanage. She helps it, gets them sent to school. And then she goes somewhere by herself in the field, under a tree, maybe in the closet, wherever she can find. And for six hours a day, she prays for the missionaries. And they talked about some of the great prayers that have been answered through her prayer. Three days out of the six days a week she prays, she fasts and prays. My heart was touched. Man, I, 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 I was overwhelmed by what I heard and some of the answers to prayer that God had given them. And so I reached in my pocket, got a business card so I had my name on it. And after it was all finished, I went and found her, got the interpreter over and I said, hey, I said, I love your story. I said, would you pray for me? She said, oh, Brother Marshall, I've already been praying for you. Now, we might not be able to pray six hours a day, but have you prayed for six minutes? Have you at least prayed for a couple minutes today for the missionaries, for the lost? We need Christians to pray. I could tell story after story of great things that have happened in our ministry because people would get together and pray. If we're going to reach this world for Christ, we must pray. We need God's power. And we receive that power through prayer. But secondly, if we're going to reach this world for Christ, we must proclaim. That simply means we've got to tell somebody else. We cannot keep it to ourselves. You need to learn to tell your family. You need to tell your neighbor. You need to tell your coworker. You need to tell your friends. Everybody you come in contact with, you need to let them know that you're a Christian and you need to do everything you can to try to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everybody needs to be involved in telling somebody about Jesus Christ. Everyone here tonight, you say, well, Brother Marshall, I just don't know what to say. I, I get tongue-tied and I don't know how to do it. I, just tell them what Jesus did for you. Give them your testimony. Tell them about the change that God made in your life. Give somebody a track. Make a phone call. Send a letter. Invite them for a meal and, uh, and then tell them about Jesus, what he did in your life. Share your testimony with somebody. Take a short-term mission trip. Invite someone to church. There's plenty of things that you can do to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Several years ago, I began to realize in my world where I was, I was always around Christians. I was always in a different church almost every night preaching the gospel. We traveled across the country with my family in an RV and preaching all the time. And uh, uh, when I was home, all of my family that I knew of, all my family, extended family even, were all saved on my side and on my wife's side. And I really just didn't come in contact with a whole lot of lost people because of my world and the way I... And I said, Lord, you know what? Give me, an, uh, give me an opportunity just to go out and reach more people. Well, about that time, I came across a, a little hobby that I enjoy, and it's a lot of fun. It's called cowboy action shooting. It's a gun sport, and uh, it's, uh, you use cowboy, cowboy guns, single action revolvers, lever action rifles, and double barrel shotguns. It's a time sport, and I got involved in that, and I was having a good time. Go on Saturday and shoot live ammo at steel targets, and uh, just a lot of fun. But then I began to realize, man, all around me, there are people that are lost. Many of them are good people, but 
They don't know Christ. And I began to try to witness to them. Ah, they put me off. I tried to give them tracks. Ah, I don't want a track. One day they said, Brother Marshall, we're going to have our state championship in North Carolina. And said, uh, we at our state championship have a cowboy church, but the last few years we've not had anybody preach at it. Would you preach our cowboy church? I said, absolutely. You don't know what you're in store for. <laughs> I worked hard. I got a crowd there that Sunday and preached to them. Had 11 people saved that first Sunday. But I began to realize there were still a lot of people that wouldn't go to my cowboy churches. I began having them all over. I began to get invited. I've preached several years now at the World Championships in Phoenix, Arizona. And so I said, Lord, i got to have another way. And so I came up with a little card. This one's a little dog-eared and a little worn out, but it's a cowboy prayer card. It's got Roy Rogers' prayer on the front. It means absolutely nothing. But on the back, it's got the gospel. And those things have gone all across the SAS community. They've been put in all the packets of the World Championships. 800 shooters will get those cards. And we've had people reported being saved because of getting those cards. Simply, I'm saying this, listen. You can reach somebody if you want to. The problem is many times we don't want to. Dear friend, listen. We've got to tell others of Jesus Christ. Five different times after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Hey, don't you think that was important to him? Then the last thing, if we're going to reach this, we're going to finish this task, every one of us must participate. We've got to give something. Every Christian can give something to the cause of reaching others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not sure exactly how you do it here, whether it's through faith promise or whether it's through designated missions funds or whatever you do. But in some way, you need to be involved in giving something for missions. Even young people can give something for missions. You know, it's all through the Bible. It's taught that if we'll give to the Lord, He'll take what we give, He'll multiply it, and use it for His glory. That story is illustrated with the boy who gave his five loaves and two fishes. God fed, I believe in the Bible it says 5,000, but many believe because the women and children weren't numbered, it could have been as many as 20,000 people that Jesus fed that day. Can you imagine the excitement of that little boy as he stood beside Jesus and watched him pass that food all over the place and fed that whole crowd? God took what he gave, he multiplied it, and used it for his glory. I'll close with this little story. I've told that it's a true story. I cannot find it written down anywhere. I wish I could because I like all the details, but I'll tell you the story as I've been told the story, and I've heard that it's true. There was a little boy who was learning about missions in Sunday school, and he had a thought, so he went to his teacher, and he said, Teacher, he said, what can a penny do for missions? She said, well, that's a very good question. He gave his penny that day, and that teacher thought about it, prayed about it, took that penny, put it on a three-by-five card, wrote the question, what can a penny do for missions? And she prayed about it, and she sent that penny with the three-by-five card and letter of explanation to a missionary who worked on the Amazon River. The missionary got the little card. It said, what can a penny do for missions? He prayed about it, thought about it, took that penny, changed it into the local currency of several centavos. He took those centavos, and he bought one gospel tract. As was his custom, he started his trek down the Amazon River, stopping at different preaching points and stopping at several churches that he'd established along the Amazon River. When he came to this one village that he had t several times tried to get into but had so far been refused. But one more time he thought, I'll stop and I'll go into that village. <clears throat> and as he went into the village, the custom was you go to the chief first, ask the chief if you can preach in the village. So he did that, went in, sat down with the chief, explained to him what he wanted to do, and the chief said, absolutely not. We have our own gods. We have our own religion. We don't need the white man's religion. We don't want you in our little town, our little city. And so the missionary rejected, was ready to leave when he thought, what about that gospel track? So he pulled the track out of his pocket, and he gave it to the chief. And he said, chief, he said, I know you can read. You've been educated. Would you just read this little piece of paper that I have? And in a few days, I'll return if you have any questions. He said, I'll be glad to answer them. Chief said, okay, I'll do that. And the missionary got in his boat and continued down the river. Several days later, after preaching in other villages and towns, he came back up the river, and as he got close to that little village, he noticed on the little dock where the boats would come in, there were a crowd of people on that dock. And they were all jumping up and down and waving spears and were chanting and singing. And, you know, when you see that on the Amazon River, you don't know if you're invited for dinner or if you are dinner. 
Well, with a little apprehension in his heart, he pulled into that little dock. And when he stepped off the boat, the crowd parted and there was the chief standing in front of him. And the chief looked at that missionary and said, Oh, missionary, we're so glad you're here. We're so glad you came back. He said, I read your little paper. He said, I did what it said, and I've asked Jesus into my heart. He said, I read that paper to all these people on the dock, and they too have asked Jesus into their heart. He said, would you come and tell us more about this one who loved us so much that he died on the cross and shed his blood for our sin and rose from the grave? Would you tell us more about him? And today, there are several churches in that area because one little boy gave a penny and a gospel track was given to a chief. God will take what you give. He'll multiply it and use it for his glory. Dear Heavenly Father, help us tonight to realize what we can do to get the gospel around the world. Lord, we can pray. Everyone in this room tonight can pray. All it takes is some of our time and effort. Lord, every one of us can tell somebody else about Jesus. We can find a way to spread the gospel. We can find a way to do it if we want to. Lord, help us to have that desire to reach others with the gospel. And Lord, every one of us here tonight can give something to send the gospel around the world. And may we do it because we love you, because we love souls, and because one day we want to see people in heaven around your throne. We give you the glory and the praise for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother True. Let's give him a hand. Thank you for preaching God's word. Pray, proclaim, and participate. Amen. That's an easy formula, isn't it? We all can do that. Amen. And uh, I thank the Lord for that very, very, very timely message and write what I needed to hear uh, a penny. We've all heard the song, Little as Much When God is in it. Well, he can take a penny. Amen. If we're willing, let him use us. Um, Brother Allen, just, we were talking about tracks. Uh, take some tracks. Pass them out. Take our church track. It's got the plan of salvation in it. Use that as a tool to talk to people. Guys at the gas station, guys at the grocery store, and use that as a track, as a, as a tool to witness for the Lord. And uh, Brother True, thank you for being here. Um, I'll get with our missions committee here in the next day or two, and we'll, we'll be making some plans and get with you on what we want to do about support. And um, church family, have you been blessed tonight? I'm thankful for what God's done for us. Amen. Thank you. Be sure and go as you're leaving tonight. Uh, go out the front lobby there and see Brother Teru and Brother Rodrigo and... Um, Issachar, thank you, and uh, get their prayer card, pray for them, and uh, introduce yourself, maybe even get an email address or whatever, be sure to communicate with them. Also, on the other side, Brother Ralph wanted us to mention that his uh, olive wood table is there. Uh, the, the good folks in uh, Bethlehem have sent some things over, so stop by there and get what you need, and uh, we just thank the Lord for uh, the opportunities we have as a church family to serve. Now, I believe we received a text from Brother John. If you have children in the children's ministry in TKC, he said he's going to need a few more minutes to unwind and probably find kids, honestly. They're probably scattered all over the place, but no, he's, uh, he's asked that we uh, give him just a few more minutes uh, to collect our children. But I want you to do one other thing. Uh, Brother Will Mercer uh, preach tonight in Tuscola at Haywood County uh, at the uh, FCA big event for the whole county of Haywood and um, a potential of thousands of kids. I know uh, they were expecting hundreds of kids to show up and the Lord gave him an opportunity to preach. And we know that it was of the Lord because on his way, opposition, uh, flat tire, had to change the tire in the middle, of the, so on the side of the road there on the interstate and just the battle uh, that we fight to preach so that young people can hear. Do you not think for one second Satan hates the gospel, especially being preached to young people who can be influenced for the rest of their life for the kingdom of God? So y'all pray for, pray for our uh, brother uh, Will and pray for brother Nathan as they uh, preach to our young people. Well, I'll tell you what, let's pray. Let's be dismissed. If you do have children, you might need to hang out for a little bit in the lobby and, um, I'd give them another five minutes or so. Father, thank you for this day. 
Thank you, Father, for your presence here on this campus and, Lord, in our hearts that we've, we've heard your word, we've heard the songs, we've been worshiping you today. And, God, you've met with us. Now, Father, I pray for these missionaries, pray for Brother Taru, that you would touch their lives. God, for Brother Issachar, that you would protect him. God, we know that his life is in your hands. You are sovereign. And we trust you with life and with death. Help us, Father, to not be ashamed. Help us, Father, to preach, and to teach, or to guard the truth, to continue in the truth, and to live and preach the truth every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good night. God bless you. We'll see you on Sunday, Sunday morning.